Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your grace, your mercy, your love. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish. We are so aware of our limitations, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been uh, looking at the practical outworking of our cooperation with God in the distribution of His grace. I welcome you to these studies. If you're new, uh, if you're not, uh, we're going to continue on in the 10th chapter. We've been looking at the opportunities that are ours to be used by the Lord in the lives of others. We found that, first of all, this administration was in a unique way limited to the body of Christ, to the family and the household of God, that it was in fact an operation of the grace of God, that it was an opportunity for us to participate in the practical outworking of God's wonderful grace. And uh, that in addition to that, it was ordained of God that there might be inequality, inequality, uh, not inequality, but inequality, that there was something lacking that could be met, that could be fulfilled in this kind of ministry lacking not only in the lives of some, uh, but of all. That is, in as much as those who gave met a need, so the very act of giving met a need in their own lives. We closed out the ninth chapter with the realization that the Holy Spirit directed Paul to declare thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, indescribable gift, and that that gift was the grace of God. Now in the 10th chapter, the Holy Spirit is, is taking just a few verses to defend this ministry in all of the epistles. Our uh, personal testimony uh, is in not what we ought to do, but it's the testimony of Jesus Christ, not some testimony of some particular experience in our own lives. In this book, where the Holy Spirit has been addressing the message to a body of believers that had been rather grossly involved in carnality, there is a we find what we find is a defense of the Word of God and the distribution of the grace of God. Grace truly does save. So there there is a defense, an apologetic, if you will which I believe is limited only to the body of Christ for the manner in which God uses His ministers. The chapter begins where the Holy Spirit has Paul urging them, beseeching them, and treating them based upon the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. And I pointed out how that, that's not... Uh, forcing, you know, uh, others. But it's not law, but it's grace. It's the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. I believe that that, that meekness there has to do with giving God the glory, being in subjection to God, the patience and the endurance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the obedience of Christ, despite what many translators want to convince you of, it's the obedience to Christ. The argument might be that Paul was very, very strong theologically when he was absent. Yeah, he said things courageously, but when present, 
he didn't do that. And in the second verse, he argues against that. By the leading of the Holy Spirit, he implores them that it will not be necessary when he comes for him to use a very bold expression of his confidence in the gospel of Christ, but that rather they might have a knowing and encouraging fellowship together. I think that we need to understand fully the intent of these verses because in a great way, in a, in a great way, we are the product of many years, many, many years of compromising the truth of the Word of God so that it does not offend. You know, we present God as a relatively helpless old man you know, who very, very much, you know, would just like, would love for you to obey him, you know, would, would be a, a super neat thing if you would condescend to, to come to him and, and choose him to be on your team. But that God really never forces anybody, never overrules the will of men, that he patiently and enduringly, he sits in heaven and he just waits and waits and waits, hoping that you'll go his way. And if you don't, well, that, that breaks his heart, but there isn't anything he can do about it. There's a presentation of the Word of God that you can make it so by your acceptance or your rejection. There is a tremendous tendency to not uh, stir the waters, uh, rock the boat, upset the apple cart, you know, however you want to uh, phrase that. Most Christians, folks, today, Avoid controversial issues like the plague. Don't want to offend anybody. Can't do that. Mm -mm. Uh, we, Steve, we have a ministry of all kinds of people, all kinds of backgrounds, diversity. You know, so you have to be very careful what you say. Well, that, that all sounds good in its rationale, folks, but it is directly opposed to the Word of God. First of all, we are commissioned to declare precisely and directly the Word of God. You are not hated and despised and criticized and laughed at and put down and made fun of and, and or suffered for the cause of Christ because you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't, you don't cuss, or you don't wear makeup or, or go to movies or whatever it might be. We teach our youth today that engaging in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is giving up all these worldly things. And a lot of people seem to take great pride in the fact, you know, that they've suffered a lot for the Lord, you know, because of that mindset. If you were to start in Genesis, and you just read clear through to the, to the end of the book, the, to the book of Revelation, and write down every verse that indicates to you why people would hate you? Why would anybody hate anybody as nice as you? Then what you'll find, is, as far as I know at least, there's only one passage, one passage, Marvel not that the world hates you. It hates you because I chose you.
Now, if you don't understand that, just, just get with, with one of the popular missionary organizations today and go out and teach that God chose and, and you'll, you'll begin to understand hate. Missionary after missionary after missionary is asked not to come back. Can't preach it that way. You can't preach it that way. Can't teach it that way. We don't do that. People get the wrong idea. In the late 80s, shortly after I actually became a Christian, a preacher said to me, well, Steve, basically, I believe as you do, but I can't preach that. I, I'm not, I won't preach that. And somehow or another, we, well, we've decided that we're the ones, we're the authority to, deci to decide what portion of the Word of God that we should teach and what portion that we shouldn't teach. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the other hand, never pulled any punches. He preached a sermon in the sixth chapter of John where we are told that the majority of his followers went back and no more walked with him. And all because he's, he, he taught election, that he chose them, that they didn't choose him, but, but he chose them. Now, I think it'd be silly to suggest all those people are headed for hell. I think the passage is clearly saying, dearly beloved, that most of the people who God, who God chose for eternal life who are going to be in heaven with Him in glory forever, most of them went back and walked no more with Him. Because, why? Because they didn't like the message. Verse 3, chapter 10 for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ. Not the obedience to Christ. Obedience of Christ. Big difference, folks. Huge difference. People are arguing that we walk carnally. Verse 2, that's verse 2. And verse 3, the Holy Spirit gets right to the point in his defense, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, we walk in flesh. Uh, but Now, I don't think that that's anything that we can't understand. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, fleshly vessels, in order that the power and the glory might be of God and not ourselves. God is a very powerful God. In fact, God is God. There is no God but our God. In fact, the more serious the work for the Lord, the less right things seem to go. And it's, it's not much of a realization for anyone who's walked very far with Christ to know that we walk in flesh. But if God had done it the other way and given you some, some kind of you know, Superman suit, you know, it wouldn't be very long until you started to, to appropriate the praise and the, the, the power and the glory and the honor you know, for yourself. You know, look what I did. It'd be a tremendous temptation for you to, to siphon off some of that, the glory. 
in fact, even though we walk in flesh, it, it, it's done every day. That's what Satan did. God put him in a, a place of authority. Then what did he do? He began to appropriate glory for himself. And as the grace of God works, many seem to, to want to siphon off a little bit of, of that for themselves, of His glory for themselves. There is the tacit admission that God did it, but there's the obvious presentation that, that boy, it's, it's their personality, it's, it's their drive, it's, it's their energy, it's, it's their intelligence, it's their wisdom, it's their talent, it's their skill, it's, we can go on and on, you know. We do walk in flesh, and I believe that there is divine reason and purpose in our walking in flesh in order that the power and the glory might be of God. Dearly beloved, takes about one second to recognize that He did it. That we couldn't have done it. That He did. That's why we don't war after the flesh. That is, we don't we don't engage in conflict like fleshly people engage in conflict. First of all, we don't use their kind of weapons. Their, their kind of instruments. The word there in the, in the Greek, I think could be translated instruments. And we don't use their kind of program. Folks, logistics is a definite science. I mean, we sit down and we figure out, we try to figure out how to wipe out the enemy, how to decimate the enemy, how to take the hill, you know, bomb the city, you know, or whatever. You know, we have tremendously important decisions to make. And we spend money on our instruments of warfare. I believe the text is saying that first of all, we do not engage in the kinds of logistics that the flesh does. And that we don't use the kind of instruments that the flesh uses. The Holy Spirit here has chosen to couch the simile in a military frame. And, and I don't think weapons is, is a bad translation at all in verse 4. Although, if you want uh, probably a more literal translation of the word, the word means instruments. But if they happen to be instruments of warfare, we normally call them weapons. The instruments of our warfare or, or the weapons of our warfare are absolutely not fleshly. The weapons of our warfare are absolutely not carnal or fleshly. But they're powerful. Mighty is your, is your authorized version. The word mighty. The word is a dunamis. They're powerful. Powerful through the God, the text says, to the pulling down of strongholds, or, or some translations have the casting down of strongholds. Strongholds. Now, I believe that the fourth verse is a verse the Holy Spirit put in a picture that is absolutely familiar to every human being. Okay? The, the military picture of conflict. And, and first of all, it'd be foolish, I think, it'd be foolish for us not to notice that we are in a conflict. The Holy Spirit has told us we're in a conflict. So, Steve, don't say anything that will cause dissension or conflict. 
impossible. The only way that you can do that is cheat the Word of God of all its power. You might as well face the fact, folks, that you are in a conflict. You really are. God doesn't mince words. Note that our conflict isn't like the normal conflict with which everyone's familiar. We don't even use the same kind of instruments, nor do we use the same kind of planning. Ours are powerful through God. Now, man's is, is powerful through numbers and military superiority, a better weapon, a better army, better training, you know, better equipment, superior numbers. Here is a verse that says that we don't work that way. Our power has nothing to do with our numbers, but God. That's our power. He's our power. And that power is the pulling down of strongholds. What does he mean? What does he mean by pulling down strongholds? Verse 5. Well, you, you, you may, in your, I don't know what translation you're using, you may read pulling down imaginations, the but the, that's, this is the word for logic. In fact, the root for log is the word from which we get our word logic. The root is the word for word. It's the logos of John 1. The authorized version has reasonings in the margin. Pulling down reasonings. That's strongholds. I am, personally, I am dead certain that what he meant by his simile in verse 4 in pulling down strongholds was the pulling down of logic, of reasonings used by the flesh. Not a physical conflict. You know, you know where we try to kill people you know, or blow stuff up. You know, like we, like we ought to get involved in some kind of a... a you know, a pseudo-religious conflict or, or religious crusade someplace. Our primary conflict results in the pulling down of human reasoning, and we're going to do that, how? By not involving ourselves in controversial issues? Are you kidding me? Now you think of what the, the controversial issues are, you know, all right, such as uh, the depravity of man, the total depravity of man, the deity of Christ, the sovereignty of God, uh, election, uh, predestination, you know, just to name a few. Election. The very heart of our Lord's love for His people. You want to criticize that? You want to call that? I don't know, I've had people call it a lot of things. Not very nice. The world's going to hate you because I chose you. Steve, I will not listen to that damnable heresy of predestination. It has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him and we can chew back and forth on that. We can, we can ride on that fence post all, all day long, but folks, the very next verse, but God has revealed them to us by His Holy Spirit. You know, we look at, at let not your heart be troubled, and many times we don't recognize that it's set right in the context of denial, of carnality, sin. I think it's marvelous to know that God's grace is with me there. 
I look at the sixth chapter of Romans and I see the typical carnal warfare, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. A brother in the Lord that I went hunting with years, several years back, five, six years ago. Oh, I wish I could do that, Steve. I've tried that five times. Doesn't work. You just, you just don't know the burden that I have trying to reckon myself dead indeed under sin. He's not, he, he wasn't being burdened doing that. You know, I reckon in kindergarten, he said at some point, yep, by golly, two, two plus two is four. It says, reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin. Well, now I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Pastor, but I know I'm, I know I'm not dead to sin because I still sin. You know, I, I, I like to play Monopoly or whatever. No place in the context is sinlessness even inferred. What I'm to do is reckon myself, count it as a fact, count it as true, it's a bookkeeping term, reckon myself dead to sin. And now, all of a sudden, I find myself in one well of a conflict in a lot of churches. I'm not supposed to talk about things like that. I'm not supposed to talk about things which cause conflict or dissension. Dearly beloved, where do folks get the idea that reckoning yourselves dead indeed unto sin means that you never sin again? Not letting sin reign in our mortal bodies means there's no sin in our mortal body. What the verse says is in the very presence of sin, reckon yourselves dead to it. It's already in your mortal body. So don't let it rain. But if I come to the conclusion that what I am is, is to be a sinlessly perfect individual, well, then I can live a defeated Christian life my whole life. Boy, some of you people, you know, reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, and you, and you made it. I never did. Now, I, I don't even know if, I, if I'm going to... Now, I, I just don't know, Steve, if I'm even going to go to heaven. And, and that, that, folks, is eventually where the human mind goes. Pulling down strongholds, human reasonings, the reasonings of the flesh. Human logic is a devastating enemy in the things of Christ. God chose us. We didn't choose. That doesn't make any sense, Steve. That goes against logic. Nothing in our conflict agrees with what we know of conflict. The kind of strategies that we know, the kind of, of campaigns that we know, the kind of energy that we know, nothing in our spiritual conflict squares with that. But ours is powerful through God. Pulling down strongholds. That's, that's pulling down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of the one true God. The word knowledge there is gnosko. It's experiential knowledge. That's, that's more than, than oida. It's more than just a head knowledge. It is, it is a knowledge that's not only of knowing, but experiencing it. There's then a, a definite campaign, uh, warfare, being waged against this knowledge of God. That campaign is by no means physical. 
that is a spiritual conflict and our instruments of warfare are to be used against concepts. Every high thing, every concept and against reasoning, human reasoning. The word high thing there reverts again back to the, the, the militaristic view that's being presented here in the text. Anybody who's ever been involved in a military campaign understands. You know, they understand. We want to hold the heights, okay? You know, we, you'd be a, I think you'd be a pretty dumb commander, you know, if you had this uh, big cliff and you said, well, hey, right, we're, we're going to establish our stronghold down here on the beach. <laughs> Somebody's going to get up there and, and drop a rock on you. Any number of, of accounts of military campaigns are, are filled, you know, with, you know, hill. You can't even watch a movie, you know, I've seen hill number 604 and hill number 409 or, or whatever. And, and the lives that were lost, taking that high ground, that high place. Well, that same picture is carried through here. These reasonings are bastions established on what the mind considers to be a high place, which is against, which is contrary to the knowledge of God. There is within the mind and the heart of man an intense desire to establish a logic, a concept, a, a thesis which doesn't demand dependence upon God. The thing that God desires most, by the way. I've pointed that out in the past. I think that what He desires the most of us is that we trust Him. That's his, I think that's His greatest desire. Our campaign is against this. How can I do that if I'm supposed to avoid controversial subjects, folks? How can I do that when I must purposely avoid passages of Scripture? Well, you can't, we can't be talking about that. You know, skip over that. You know, causes too much friction. In fact, many times if, we just have to ignore the context. Behold, I set before you this day good and evil. Choose good and live. And I'm asked to ignore the fact that that was said to Christians. I'm supposed to, to preach it as though it's, it's said to the masses and those, those, who, those who choose good are Christians and, and, and those who don't are or non-Christian. You know, somehow or another today, even, even in evangelical circles, well, things like that are just not considered blasphemy. I, I think it is. You know, that's considered love and gentleness and understanding, you know, to not have any, want any conflict. And Not a sense of compromise, so much as it is a, a sense of tolerance for the other position or, or the other person's convictions. And what, what it really is, is one of those little bastions, one of those little high places that is set up against the knowledge of God. It's that conflict that's, that's, that's in you here. It's that kind of, of word that was powerful, in Corinth. It changed lives. Grace changed the lives of those in a, in a, in a city, in Corinth, that, who were, they, God said they were the most carnal. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. To the obedience of Christ. 
Now, I've tried to set what I believe is a, at least an, an honest picture of the context. And, and folks, that ruins the evangelical message of this verse. I believe most Christians take this verse as Paul presenting his own personal testimony. You know, that he brought every one of his thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so, well, that's, that's, what that's what you ought to do. That's what we ought to do. Every aspect of your life, every corner of your mind, every thought that you have ought to be brought into the obedience of Christ. But if we stick with the military picture that the Holy Spirit has chosen here to give us, and I pointed this out in previous at least one previous video, I know it's been several years ago, that the, the captives were taken and led in chains before the masses and then executed or sold into slavery. When a Roman commander came back from a military campaign, the more captives that he had, well, the more popular he was, the more successful he was. You know, he's not going to get promotions you know, unless he has a, a big victorious parade and he comes back with people that are treated mercilessly, led in chains, eventually either executed or sold into slavery. It seems to fit the context that, that every one of these erroneous designs, every, every one of these strongholds, every one of these high places, when we enter into conflict, when we, when we enter into a campaign against those through the power of God, they are brought captive to the obedience of Christ. So it's not a, an evangelical, uh, evangelistic picture of, of, of one coming to Christ. You know, becoming a new creation in Christ or of surrendering his life, an already born-again Christian, surrendering his life a second time to, to deeper sanctification or or anything like that. But it is in fact an indication that these false reasonings, these false approaches that are set up, exalted against the knowledge of God, dearly beloved, that they are going to lose and that Christ is going to be the victor. I believe that fits the context that this is not an appeal to the Christian to become totally submissive to Christ. And, and, I want to, and please listen, all right? I am not saying that you shouldn't, okay? Do that. Do not get me wrong. My Bible tells me that you ought to reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, that you should not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. That you should obey it. That you should not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But that you should yield. You should yield your members as instruments unto God. I believe that. I just don't think that this verse says that. I believe this verse is the promise of victory. That if we are faithful with the Word of God, if we're not playing games, but we are seriously sincere and faithful with His Word, that the captivity here is not a captivity of the new creation. 
but a captivity into the obedience of Christ of that which is exalted against God. The, uh, I think a good parallel passage would be that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Does that mean that every knee is going to heaven and, and every tongue is going to, to heaven? No. I think people going to hell are going to submit themselves to Christ and confess that He's God of God, Lord of Lord. As far as I know, that's the only passage of forced worship in the entire Bible, as far as I know. The word that we have to proclaim is a powerful word. I think it's a, a terrible admission to our lack of interest in the things of Christ that we would so compromise. Folks, it's a serious conflict. What happened in the life of Paul was imprisonment Beatings, starvation, shipwreck. If he'd lived during our time, he'd be censored, kicked off out of Twitter, or whatever. Folks, why were people out to kill Paul? Well, he, ran, he went around in ta punching him in the jaw. He went around antagonizing these poor folks. No, he did not. He proclaimed the truth of the Word of God, and men... Folks, men would bind themselves together and declare that we will not eat until we kill Paul. What awful thing has this man done? Well, well, he, he healed some people, you know, and he preaches that Christ rose from the dead. And you're not going to eat until you kill this man? If you haven't faithfully tried to proclaim the truth of the Word of God, you're not even aware of the conflict. But it's there. It's real. And dearly beloved, it is huge. I believe that we have a promise of victory. That if we are faithful with the Word of God, the weapons of our warfare... And, and our reliance on the power of God that, that every design exalted against God we can bring down to the power of God. And they will be soon. Very soon. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.